I am the project manager and consulting coordinator here at Partners. And as you can see, um, I am based in the Chicago office. And we have two amazing panelists who are gonna lead the discussion today. Bob Yeager is the founder and president of Partners for Sacred Places. He is the author of Sacred Places at Risk, Sacred Places in Transition and Strategies for Stewardship and Active Use of Older Religious Properties. Bob has also served with the Philadelphia Historic Preservation Corporation. So if you're looking for an expert in creative use and preservation of historic religious properties, Bob is it. Bob, is there anything you'd like to add? Well, just to say uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I recognize a, a number of names, uh, as Joshua just said, and we're thrilled to have old friends with us today, as well as some folks that are new to us. And I just wanna say, when we were founded 31 years ago, we said that sacred places were clearly critical to the health and vitality of our communities. And it's exciting to have a conversation today about new ways to stay engaged. So um, I'm excited about our conversation today. Thanks, Bob. So our next panelist is Joshua Castaño, who is our Director of Community Engagement Services here at Partners. Joshua has several years of experience in our organization, helping congregations to faithfully steward their buildings through serving their wider community. Joshua began his life and career in Patterson, New Jersey, where he helped build partnerships between historic congregations and public institutions. And Joshua, what else should our audience know about you? Well, I am very proud to be from Patterson, New Jersey, of course, um, and started my, my career in historic preservation community development there. And uh, I'm also a person of faith and, and involved and active in the parish that I attend, St. Mark's Episcopal Church here in Philadelphia, which is a national historic landmark. So it's an old building that needs lots of work, uh, seemingly every year, <laughs> nonstop. That's how it is with old buildings. And uh, I'm the treasurer there. And so I, I do understand and want to point out that I, I get it when we're looking at budgets and thinking about stewardship and signing checks and paying bills every week. So I get that on a personal level and uh, help bring that um, perspective into my professional work too. I'm glad to be here today. And finally, we are excited to have Reverend Christopher Johnson here with us today. Reverend Johnson is the current rector at All Saints Episcopal Church in Pontiac, Michigan. And in his career, Reverend Johnson has worked with congregations and dioceses to identify and leverage their resources to better serve their communities around them. And that kind of experience and wisdom is definitely needed right now. And Reverend Johnson, is there anything else that you'd like to add? I would just like to say hello to the folks that have joined. And particularly, I'd like to say thank you to you and uh, my colleagues at Partners for Sacred Places for your vision and for inviting me to be part of this conversation today. I look forward to our time together. Thanks. So now for our audience, I'm gonna say that we are all going to disappear visually from your screens and you'll only see the slides, but our faces will all be back um, at the end of this webinar. So we'll start with a brief overview of Partners, who we are and what we do. Partners for Sacred Places was founded in 1989 as a preservation organization in Philadelphia. We are unaffiliated with any tradition or denomination, and we've worked with a multitude of faith communities across the United States. And in a nutshell, we help faith communities be the best stewards of their buildings that they can be. We assist congregations to identify the best strategies for caring for their historic buildings with an eye towards preserving their architectural character. We work with congregations to engage their surrounding communities and maximize their potential as community assets. And we do this through various forms of training, grant funded programs and consulting services. We take an asset based approach to this work and we've built up decades of experience in existing congregations to identify the unique resources that they have and help them discern where and how those resources can help them partner with and serve their neighbors. And Joshua is gonna tell you a little bit more about how we do that. Thanks so much, Sarah. So I do wanna point out that we've developed a really wonderful consulting practice that allows us to work one-on-one -on -one with congregations. And in some cases, uh, judicatories like dioceses or presbyteries, et cetera, and even other faith-based faith institutions that steward historic religious properties. And this consulting practice, like all of our work is really comprehensive. It is asset-based. 
and it embodies the best of what we've learned in 30 years of experience. So we help congregations learn how to tell their story, um, understanding their value to the wider community, and really build a network of partners and advocates and allies beyond the congregation who can support their work and help champion uh, them in the rest of the community. We also help congregations think about how to really convene and gather a group of stakeholders and leaders throughout their community who represent a wide variety of institutions um, across the community. And we do this by using some of the tools from the asset-based community development approach, such as asset mapping, which helps unlock the potential and possibilities of a congregation and its people and its building and its historic property, as well as working with what we call community advisory committees that bring together some of these leaders to offer key advice guidance and connections to a congregation. And of course, we also help congregations uh, face the thornier questions around how their building might adapt or change uh, while respecting its character, but also helping it meet some of the new opportunities that uh, they have all around them. And so we do this by helping them connect with and work with designers in tools like design charrettes that allow them to see some new visions, architecturally speaking, uh, for the way that their building can continue to serve and make the most of these opportunities. And of course, we pull all of this together in our groundbreaking community-wide approach to fundraising, believing, uh, as, we've, as we have for many years, that because of their public value, congregations can build a strong network of supporters and partners beyond the stained glass curtain and raise funds successfully from their wider community. So with that, I want to actually ask Bob Yeager to get us started with today's presentation and take us into the heart of the topic that we're going to be addressing. Thank you, Joshua. Again, this is Bob Yeager and uh, our kind of title today is still open to serve and how do we serve in new ways in the midst of this pandemic. And we wanted to start by reminding ourselves of what sacred places have done in recent years. It's all been kind of interrupted by the pandemic, but we did some research with the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Work, um, two rounds of research, the latest of which is shown here. Um, and we kind of tried to understand the larger halo effect of a sacred place, like one that you have, and what is the impact you have in your community. And one of the things we learned is that almost 90% of the people you serve in, uh, by the programs that are housed in your building, almost 90% are not your members, which is a powerful message to civic leaders that you are in effect a public asset, you're a community center. And um, that's an important reason for them to care about you and to help you both before the pandemic and certainly now as you try to think of new ways to stay engaged and to use your space and to be of service. So um, it's, it's helpful to give this as, as kind of a context for what our conversation today. We also did some um, research. Uh, Sarah was terrific in kind of leading this effort to understand what's happening now. And of course, you won't be surprised that most congregations are using their building a little bit to perhaps record their worship services uh, for broadcasting or for live streaming. But in terms of outreach uh, programs, most of those programs have moved out of the building, um, in large part because social distancing may not be possible for those programs. But clergy are still in touch with those programs or those leaders to find out what is happening now. Are those clients still being served in other ways? Interestingly, very few of the churches and synagogues we reached out to have been in touch with FEMA or the health sector to see if sacred places might be of greater service to meet health needs. So that already indi indicates a possibility for some of our sacred places. So that, that was some interesting survey uh, work on what is happening with our sacred places now. So, so what do we wanna cover in the next hour? Um, we wanna talk about different ways that sacred places can still be visible, can still be present, can still be engaged. Um, so, you know, how, um, how do we make sure that the community sees us as still open and vital, but open differently, that we're there to serve, but differently, that we have assets that might be particularly helpful now in, this, in the era of the pandemic? And of course, we realize that things are changing rapidly. Some sacred places are beginning to open up a little bit, carefully, thoughtfully, safely. Um, 
but we've heard that some sacred places may not be fully up to uh, their old levels of activity until the fall or even sometime next year. So in this meantime, what new opportunities might there be? What are the long-term impacts and implications of this current uh, pandemic? And how might we be changing? How might we rethink how our sacred place could be open and serving in this new era? So um, let's, let's first talk about the messaging, about being present and being visible. Um, in the next slide here, we love this banner. Um, this was just put up at Trinity Episcopal Church in Covington, Kentucky, right across the river from Cincinnati. The rector there, Peter Danjo, is a member of our board and inspired by an earlier webinar, his parish ordered three banners like this. And they put them up around the church to say to Covington, we're still here, we're not only available for worship, but we're available in other ways. And we think this is a very powerful message. And I think it's one of the things we can do. How can we message to our community for those who are driving by or walking by? People may not be going to work in downtown like they were before, but they still have to go to the grocery store. They may still go out for a drive. What is the message we want to send? Can it be a banner that we put up for the next few months or a lawn sign? Can we vary the bulletin? that's in front of the church to say, hey, we are still here. Are you, is your building lit up at night? Does it look at, at 10 o'clock at night like the building is fully abandoned? We encourage you to light the building and make clear that it's still alive. It may not be full of people every day, but it's being cared for, it's being looked after, and you're still there to serve. Also, your website and your social media platforms. You're probably doing things on those platforms already, but you might wanna be very explicit about the role you're playing in the era of the coronavirus. We'll be talking later about Broad Street Ministry in downtown Philadelphia, which is doing some very innovative things uh, in its building and in the neighborhood. And they have a full page just on their response to COVID-19 with updates on how they're serving the community in some new ways. And then lastly, you know, of course you're talking to your members, but this is a good time to reach out to your friends and to civic leaders and to think in new ways about how you might work with them. So, you know, things may be different, but they're not dead. It's an opportunity to begin some new conversations with those who care about you, not just your members, but your neighbors and civic leaders. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Joshua? Thanks, Bob. So along with staying in touch and communicating about your presence, we also want you to think about how you're going to stay engaged and connected to people. You know, the biggest challenge of social distancing is this sense or this anxiety even in our communities that we're cut off or we're isolated from one another. And so, you know, congregations have a sort of special calling to bring people together. And though you can't do it physically, how can you still demonstrate that calling to connect to gather, to convene, to be there for people. So we encourage you to begin in terms of your reflections this way of thinking about what your community might need. And how are you gonna find out about what your community needs? Well, we encourage you to talk to civic leaders. There might be a few key civic leaders that you already know really well, uh, like maybe an elected official, maybe a leader of a local social services or human uh, social services nonprofit that you know very well, like the Y or United Way or something like that. But whoever it might be locally, are there some, some people who have been allies or friends of the congregation that are not members outside, you know, beyond the stained glass windows uh, that can help you start to understand what's going on in the community around you and start to fill you in on how their institutions are handling uh, the pandemic and also how they're responding to and understand the needs of the community around you. Uh, so that's really key. You have to start talking to people and listening, asking them to share with you a little bit about what they're experiencing. There are lots of other tools too that could be helpful. Um, there are community bulletin boards, Facebook groups, and Facebook can be really helpful for a lot of different organizations. There are even apps like Nextdoor, which you can avail yourselves of. Uh, newsletters, for instance, and you know, think about it. Uh, many of your congregations likely put out a monthly or weekly newsletter or email blast. How many of the key institutions in, the, in your community around you do the same thing? Well, 
maybe for the time being, you might actually want to sign up for some of those and start to pay attention and listen to what's happening um, by, by reading that. So I really encourage you to get in touch, to listen, to continue a conversation with all of those folk. Uh, that's a really critical way uh, to show that you're still engaged with them. So we also now want to kind of shift and start talking about some of the specific ways that you might be able to put this together. Um, affirming that you're there, uh, being in touch and engaged with folk, and then also now moving into the opportunities you might have. So Bob's going to describe for us uh, one of the first key steps in thinking about how to take advantage of some of these new opportunities. Great. Thank you, Joshua. And to kind of build on what Joshua just uh, discussed, what are the things you might consider in, in taking a fresh look at your building assets and your other assets around your building, including green space and parking lots, is to maybe invite a civic leader, the kind of people that Joshua has discussed, one at a time, safely, carefully, uh, with a mask, invite them to walk around your building with you and to take a fresh look at what it offers. And they may help you see some opportunities to use your space in some new ways. And when we hear from Father Chris in a few minutes about All Saints and Pontiac, we'll find out how they are using some of their open spaces around their building. So indeed, large spaces inside your building and spaces around your building may be much more conducive to uh, outreach that is socially distanced because of course people can spread out and both volunteer supporters and staff as well as those being served can come together in a safe way, in a distanced way. So green spaces, uh, park-like spaces, parking, parking lots, all can be very useful now in a way that you didn't think of a few months ago. So that is one, uh, one of your assets you might look at in a fresh new way. And again, with a civic leader by your side, he or she might help you see, aha, that is a space that would be perfect for something that's emerged during the pandemic that would help you be uh, useful to your community. One of the things that our survey work has indicated is that many, many congregations are still keeping their custodial staff on site to take care of the building, to maintain the building, to keep it clean, which means that they could be available to rearrange and set up your spaces for some new activities. <clears throat> of course, again, in a safe way. So even though you may not have your other staff on site, your custodial staff may be there and they could help you reconfigure some of your spaces to, to serve in new ways. And, and don't forget the nonprofits that you normally have worked with, uh, the ones that may have shared space in your building, to be in touch with them and to think about, well, gosh, given what's happening in our community, might we use our assets in some new ways? Again, I think one of our leitmotifs in today's conversation is reach out have conversations, invite folks in again with care, invite them to think with you about your assets, your people, your out, outdoor space, your indoor spaces, that, that dining room, that kitchen, those classrooms, <clears throat> the sanctuary, all may take on some new significance when you have people by your side to help you think about how they could serve in some new ways. Thanks, Bob. So really, it's very key to think about, you know, creative uh, things that you haven't, that haven't come to you before, you know, um, opportunities that maybe didn't make sense six months ago, but now have sort of emerged surprisingly to you. Um, so while you may not be able to do a lot of the things that you typically are doing in your building, um, there could be other programs um, that could use your building. You could collaborate, work with uh, other organizations. So you might have to shift in terms of moving away from something that you have led or has really been your program to maybe collaborating or supporting someone else's work, but that's still just as valuable and still just as important to your neighbors and to the people in your community that need your help. Uh, that are looking for the assets that you have to offer. So really being in touch with these other institutions helps you really discern that. You know your assets and you know what you have to offer, but also the people that you're talking to will be able to help you see some of what you have to offer in a new light. 
that you may have overlooked before. And so that's really key. That's kind of an important part of this too, is how can conversation with those people help you see what you have to offer in a new light? Um, and, and these new ways that you can do it, that you can work together. So with that in mind, we want to just share two examples. We've talked to a lot of congregations across the country in many different contexts, small towns, big cities, um, you know, Northeast, Midwest, um, Appalachia. And, of, and we know that your stories are going to be just as remarkable and that there are lots of congregations we're reaching who are doing amazing, creative, highly resourceful um, responses to this pandemic and to the needs of their neighbors. But we did want to just share two examples from different contexts because we thought that this would be really helpful and, hope, and also hopefully inspiring to you as well. So Bob will share a little bit more about Broad Street Ministry here in Philadelphia, and I'll start us off in talking about Mars Hill Baptist Church in Mars Hill, North Carolina. So this is a great little college town in central Appalachia, um, up uh, in the mountains, basically, in western North Carolina. And this is a really awesome example of just creative resourcefulness in congregations. So in this community, the schools um, were closed as they've been closed in many parts of the country, most of the, the nation. And the congregation was attuned enough to their community to know that uh, many of the children around them that district are food insecure. So they really rely on the meals that they can access at school um, to supplement. Um, the, new, the, the lack of nutrition or the, the food insecurity they have, they experience at home. So what they did was um, they kind of connected a lot of different assets. They had people who had resources in terms of money and donations, and they wanted to give to the church to help the church find a way to serve people in the community that were being impacted by the, by the pandemic. Uh, and the church also uh, had some connections to people in the school district. So they actually approached the bus drivers, the school bus drivers, they approached volunteers, both their own and, and worked with a wider network of volunteers. And they used the donation, the financial donations they got to <laughs> allow them to have uh, meals made safely by volunteers, dropped off safely, you know, respecting social distancing, and then delivered by the school bus drivers to the students, of course, who knew where the students lived. Uh, which is just a really amazing experience. The other thing that they've done was um, a lot of people have been, you know, sending them their stimulus checks saying, you know, they may be in circumstances where that they don't need it. Uh, it's not necessary for them. They're economically secure. Um, and so the church has been using that money in part for the program I just described, but also to coordinate young people. So people in their twenties, college age and high school age um, folk to, shop for groceries and deliver groceries to the elderly and shut in their community. So they're really making sure that they're looking for the people who might be overlooked uh, as the uh, especially isolated, for instance. So really amazing, uh, ingenious example of connecting assets and serving and uh, keeping in mind for those who might be at the margins of what their community is experiencing. Bob, can you tell us a little bit about Broad Street Ministry? Uh, yes, Joshua, thanks. And, and by the way, I'm so glad you've talked about Mars Hill because we have a new program serving uh, churches in Appalachia. Uh, and so we've been learning a lot from the example of Mars Hill and others. And in, in downtown Philadelphia, uh, we've worked with Broad Street Ministry for years. Uh, this is a remarkable ministry uh, in a more traditional Gothic uh, revival building that was once occupied by a uh, Presbyterian congregation. This is now a kind of new and innovative uh, Presbyterian ministry that's participating in our national fund for sacred places, by the way. So we really uh, respect what they're doing. And you can see this marvelous uh, sanctuary space that's now used for feeding and other activities. Um, and Broad Street is famous uh, nationally for its innovative uh, and collaborative work to serve the currently homeless. And um, they had to rethink how they would serve this population in the midst of the pandemic. One of the things they normally do is provide a place for the currently homeless to pick up their mail, which could continue, and to provide lockers for their belongings, which could continue. But a lot of the feeding and medical work they normally do in the building would have to be, would go elsewhere because it couldn't be done there in a socially distanced way. So they've done this 
marvelous new innovative collaboration called Step Up to the Plate, working with the city of Philadelphia, with Project Home, which is another uh, program serving the homeless, with a special services district, which is called Center City District, and with others. They've even worked with the Mural, mural Arts uh, Organization um, to, pro to provide two open air service areas, one in downtown Philadelphia and one in a neighborhood called Kensington, to serve the currently homeless in ways that would be socially distanced. So they made the most of their existing property, but they also thought about, well, can we do something nearby, working with our partners to make sure that the people we care about and the populations we serve do not go hungry and do not go un un unserved. So they've managed to do both, use their space to best advantage, but also do some new things a few blocks away, working with their partners. They've also, by the way, created hand washing stations throughout of downtown Philadelphia, because of course, the currently homeless also need a place to make sure that they can wash their hands and not pass on their virus to other people. So they've done some amazing things there. Wow, what a terrific story. Thanks for sharing, Bob. And I love to just emphasize thinking about both of these stories that we've uh, talked about here. If you can't do it because <laughs> if you can't make it happen in your building right now, might there be a way to give? What do you have to give? Uh, is it time? Is it financial resources? What, what can you give if you can't actually host the program in your building? And it, along those same lines, if you can't host things the way that you used to, um, can you still organize? Can you still access that wonderful, tremendous asset that empowers so many congregations of organizing and bringing people together and getting them focused around a need or a project. So that's really important. You can think about lots of different collaborations this way. You know, there's mutual aid projects, there's other resources that are happening and popping up in our communities. How can you be a part of that? How can you connect the dots around you? Um, also remember, let people know what you have to offer. Let them know that you're there, that you're present, that you're willing to share what assets you have to make good things happen. And don't forget to listen. And the really key thing is that some of the conversation partners you'll encounter outside of the congregation will open up and illuminate, and almost like aha moments, illuminate um, for you assets or things you can do that you may have overlooked before, just because it's a habit of ours, day to day, day in, day out, the same patterns. We, we tend to focus on certain things and, and not on others. But, but having a good conversation partner can really be like a, a mirror that opens up a new way of seeing ourselves and what we have to give. So this is why that conversation is important, why affirming that you're there is important, and thinking uh, with an asset-based approach first. So. With that, sorry, I want to actually invite Sarah and the Reverend Chris Johnson uh, to share a little bit of All Saints story with us. We're so glad that Chris is here. Yes, thank you, Joshua. <clears throat> and thank you, Bob and Joshua, both for such a great presentation. And I wanna welcome again, Reverend Christopher Johnson, whose parish has been in the thick of relief efforts in Pontiac, Michigan and uh, you have found new and creative ways to continue to serve. So Reverend Johnson, can you tell us a little bit about All Saints Episcopal Church and its place in the community of Pontiac before the pandemic? Sure, uh, that was the product of many years of evolution for a community, but we have about 40 community partners that uh, have been partly uh, supportive of uh, our community breakfast, a free community breakfast that we offer every Saturday and if that Saturday fell on Christmas, it would still be the community breakfast that so we feed about 150 to 200 people uh, a free breakfast every morning, every Saturday morning. We have a, a, a program bound together that is an after school program mentoring about 24, 25 kids. Each child has about three mentors that would work with them Monday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for the entire school year. So we have about 75 volunteers supporting uh, that program. It began at All Saints. It's been able to successfully spin off to be its own nonprofit, but it's very much uh, a product that this community supports. We have a community produce market where we're in a food desert part of Pontiac. So 
We have many neighbors and people that have come to rely on coming to All Saints for uh, market priced or below market price, fresh fruits and vegetables that uh, help meet their basic needs. And those along with myriad other kinds of programs that help a congregation participate in the life of the community. So that was the vibrant life as it was pre COVID-19. Yeah, and so in early March, when things were changing really rapidly and we were being told to you know, shelter in place very quickly, how did you and the rest of All Saints discern what programs could move forward and how you were going to adapt and modify those programs? Well, first of all, we, I could say we did not have in place a great crisis prevention planning meeting, and uh, that probably would have been a real asset. But uh, we have a mission statement that, in addition to worship and prayer, has held that our values include service and stability. And so in the world of prioritization of our response, uh, we are obviously really committed to food, physically feeding people who are uh, working, either they're working poor or they are simply homeless. And so it was easy for us to prioritize feeding people as a service and providing that as a stable piece, something they could count on like that breakfast week after week, not only barring Christmas, but not even barring the COVID response. And so our prioritization turned towards uh, feeding people and, uh, and that's how we had to begin the process of uh, focusing on, on what we would do. Uh, so evolving out of that, Sarah, was uh, a program like Bound Together, an important component, as I shared, that uh, had a snack every afternoon for its students. In fact, on Monday and Friday, we offered frequently art classes or cooking classes. But... Yeah. Soon those community partnerships were able to then realize, well, we can't feed kids because uh, they can't go in the building like they are. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as a result of that, uh, we had to begin the process of uh, adapting to help us do that. And uh, without getting far ahead of us, I just simply want to say that when your volunteer base is a lot of people, 65 to 80 years old, and that happens to be the target group that you're trying to really make sure stay away from your site, we lost a huge piece of our volunteer network in the process of having to restabilize. Or I might add, we lost the way that they were used to volunteering for us mm -hmm. to make that happen. So that's where the, the creativity came in. and. Uh, and I'm happy to expound on that. So just tell me how I might be able to do that in a meaningful way for you and for our audience. Yeah, I think our audience would be really interested to learn, you know, how exactly y'all have adapted, especially with your feeding programs, which relied on your big auditorium and commercial kitchen, and how you've been able to continue that ministry now that, you know, people can't come into the building. We ended up out in the parking lot. One of those assets that it's not an asset when you're thinking, man, how are we going to afford to put sealer and resurface and tire and maintain and pave that parking lot? Every congregation's like, that's a liability for us. But that liability became a huge asset because we got shut out of our building ourselves as a congregation. Uh, we were really left to having one or two people that could go in to work in the kitchen, for instance. And so what we did is we moved our feeding program for the breakfast meal out into the kitchen, out into the auto parking lot. Uh, we set up a big red tent. You saw that little red tarp pop up. And that's basically part of the communicating to the neighborhood that we're here. Uh, because our guests walk, a lot of them walk, some of them drive, but they came into that space. Uh, we began to network with other congregations to, through things like Sign Up Genius that they would veil so we could bring volunteers. We were limited to four a week. Uh, and so uh, outside at any given time. So the space had to get set up outdoors and then our volunteers would come in and go. Uh, we bound together, for instance, without having access to that pool of volunteers we end up networking with people like Oakland County, uh, Oakland Livingston Human Service Agency, a large nonprofit that says, we'll bring you food, 
for your kids. Every family, no questions asked, 14 meals for a seven day week for your kids, including milk, we'll bring that to your kids every week if you'll simply distribute it out in your parking lot. So we started recruiting from other partners in the community and other congregations. So again, four people, but we're outside feeding 1400 meals to 100 kids every week. And, uh, and then finally to respond to that, some people have started giving gift cards and things that families could have. So it would even augment family resources while their kids are being fit, fed. Mom and dad still need to eat. Uh, so the programs both evolved. We weren't successful yet on the food produce market, but, but we're not done with this and we'll uh, continue to adapt. Uh, programs that were led by those seniors, again, changed our whole model of ministry as part of the adapting. But even in the partnerships out in that community, Oakland County Sheriff's Department, their deputy shows up and on a Friday when we're done with food, they pick up extra food, throw it in the back of the, the uh, dep uh, deputy's thing. And then while they're out making their rounds, if they see a homeless person or somebody with a parent need, they'll even offer them bags of food to help them go. Uh, and uh, our diocese made feeding a priority. The congregation kicked in a, a large chunk of money, $50,000 towards a diocesan initiative for feeding and, uh, and one of those feeding partners is Forgotten Harvest, a large supplier in the Southeast Michigan and throughout so that they also are getting food into Pontiac uh, community area. So that's kind of the post uh, COVID-19. It's not always pretty because you know the people that come up to you if they're coming off the streets they're uh, coming in as they are, and you want to make sure your volunteers understand good PPE, but don't expect that of the people coming in because they're living with real hardship and they are the most vulnerable among us. And we're hoping that we can even start getting them uh, homemade masks and things if they would like them to protect themselves. Yeah, and we've been really inspired by All Saints and y'all's response to the COVID-19 crisis, and I'm sure a lot of the attendees today would like to know how they can take what you've learned and apply it in their congregations. So what is one or two key suggestions that you would have um, for our audience to walk away with? Yeah, Bob uh, pointed this out and I was doing a DMIN class and the professor said Semper Gumby, always flexible from that mark of Gumby and Pokey back in the 70s, something you don't know anything about, Sarah. <laughs> but Bob, Bob knows about Gumby and Pokey and being flexible always, that is absolutely critical. We, we get familiar with the ways we do things. And as Bob is saying, we and, and Joshua are saying, we have to open ourselves up into conversation. Listen to our uh, partners as they begin to tell us uh, what they need so that we can figure out how to adapt and offer our products, which is what we did, in fact, with Olsha County, uh, our Olsha Livingston Human Service Agency. They had food, but they didn't have a way to get it out. Uh, so we took things that we had, like our, uh, our parking lot, put it to work. It's already there. We had a parishioner, when we're listening, who is a media specialist. And next thing we know, she's working with uh, Pontiac Community Foundation and Oakland University to create a, a visual aid that shows people where 11 different feeding programs are in the county and who their constituency is and their contacts are and when they can call them. That's a real asset that we had available within our resources that we made available to the larger community. Uh, so know your assets listen to the people, be flexible so you can respond to what they need rather than worry about forcing yourself to do things that you were doing or the way you were doing them because you just can't do it the way you were doing it. We will not be that way again. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I'm sure folks uh, have other questions for you and we'll get back to that in a few minutes when we get to our Q&A portion. Uh, right now, I'd like to turn it back over to Bob for some thoughts on how this current experience can help us prepare for the future of building stewardship. 
Great. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Father Chris. Uh, that story from All Saints is fantastic and inspiring. And by the way, um, uh, the cover article for our national magazine, Sacred Places, will feature All Saints and uh, with a larger discussion of how Sacred Places can be of service in this time. But the All Saints story is so great that we're going to feature it also in that cover article, which should be out at the end of June. So you might look for that. We do want to provide some time for Q&A, but just a, a few final thoughts, because of course, you know, things are changing every day and some sacred places are starting to open up again, carefully, partially, but you know, we know there will be more to come. Um, they're saying the coronavirus may come back in the fall in a second wave or a third wave. It may be worse than what we suffered now. That's a possibility. Uh, we know that some businesses and restaurants may not open again, and that city governments are suffering, and state governments are suffering. Arts groups may not ha have an easy way to serve their audiences uh, th like they used to do. Um, a lot of human service groups may be stressed. So um, there's a lot happening, and it's frightening and scary and overwhelming at times, but it also may suggest some new ways uh, for us to serve, for new, some new ways for our sacred places to be shared and used. So I think some of what we've tried to talk about today may really be helpful as we think about now and we think about the summer and we think about the fall. Because what, what's, uh, what's gonna be the situation in September will probably not be what we're seeing now. So how can we continue to be open? As Sarah just said, and as Father Chris just said, how can we be listening how can we think in new ways about our assets? Because things are gonna change again and again. Great, thank you, Bob. We're now gonna enter the Q&A portion of this webinar. So if y'all could um, put your questions into the Q&A box and we will all start our videos and return to y'all. Um, I know we already have one question uh, that was in the chat box. Um, Jim Treese is asking uh, if Reverend Johnson, could you give some more specifics on keeping the above 65 age group of volunteers involved, even though they can't do it the way they usually do it? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, we took a 20 something person uh, went into one of the parishioners homes who's 90 wanted to be involved and they just taught him how to use the zoom system and uh, That person was able to then participate in zoom meetings and actually Told me one day how excited she was that she could see people again and participate and I don't want to underestimate Jim how important it is for people that find themselves isolated to feel seen, yet alone also feel connected. So that's one way. And then obviously through Zoom, you can invite people into group discussions. And I think that that way their voice can be heard as they look at the challenges and we invite them to contribute to the thinking process of how do we solve this challenge? Another way is, is that we have 60 something people, that is the over 65 people, some of them are making masks and doing things like that because that's what they can do. And they want to be able to contribute so they can put masks together, put them in baggies singly and then put them in a bag and let somebody come by their place to pick them up and bring them and make them available to people. Uh, some of them can make phone calls to volunteers and they love to be able and are very comfortable and adept at using the phone. And so we get them into the communications web so they can again be part of the dialogue of what's happening and, and the organizing of people. And I think it's simple things like calling them and asking them for their advice. Uh, some people could make something uh, at home. We, we, uh, at one church down in Birmingham that the people make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, put them in baggies, then they gather all the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, bring them up to the breakfast. So not only do they walk away with a bag with their breakfast in it, but they actually have another bag with something to, to eat later on 
in the world of things like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So those are just some concrete ways, Jim, that, that uh, you could offer somebody the opportunity to contribute and do something. And as Joshua mentioned earlier, people can write checks. And some people are very happy because they feel so helpless. Give them a chance to contribute in a meaningful way. Let them write their check so they know they did something rather than they sat home and were helpless. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, so, Jeanne, I hope I'm saying your name right. Jeanne Alexander is asking um, kind of about the size of All Saints. And uh, as a follow-up to that question, I would also ask our panelists, you know, how do you think about uh, congregational responses based on size and based on the area they might be? Well, All Saints has been in Pontiac since 1837, so we have a lot of cumulative years and we've gone on a roller coaster up and down. I say that because some of your community partnerships are forged over just having been present over a period of time in a community. And, and I don't want to understate the importance and that that is an asset and you want that history to count, even if your job is to rewrite the history. All Saints is a congregation that was a prominent leader in Pontiac and and, uh, and then when uh, issues around open housing and open busing emerged in the late 60s and 70s, uh, we lost a lot of membership because we stood on the side of uh, our, our neighbors of color as being part of this congregation and opening the doors. It was really essential. Why do I share that? I share that because here 40 and 50 years later, uh, we have a congregation that on a typical Sunday pre-COVID was maybe 70 to 80 people between our two services, uh, knowing that uh, most of our parishioners came from actually outside of Pontiac because their love for this community. And then we have all these partners within Pontiac, as I mentioned, probably about 40. Uh, those relationships, uh, we, we continue to leverage today. And I'd say they're part of the reason that we do what we do. It's not just on the backs of the congregants that are coming to the church on Sunday, nor is it just on the backs of the people in Pontiac. We have, we have the backs of being part of a larger community and a community bigger than All Saints. And so I would say that it's probably in your advantage to be cultivating those other relationships and know that what we do in the pews, well, very, very important. I mean, face it, that's part of our pledge base that helps pay the bills. But don't understate the, the impact of our partners in the community because they help our parishioners when they feel helpless. They help them feel excited and inspired because they uh, are right there with us, supporting us, so that the backs we're on are, are much bigger. And I hope you'll find that as a practical experience that you can continue to leverage your own experience as a congregation on. That is so beautifully said, uh, uh, Chris. Thank you so much. I, I would just add, I mean, I think size is important uh, in some ways, but we've really seen over many years of experience that um, small congregations can be very mighty in what they're able to accomplish and that partnerships and collaboration and connecting the dots is you know as important as how many people are in the pews on sunday morning um you know th that is really one of the biggest parts of this and and uh, joshua this is bob uh, joshua on that note i'm so glad you said that because I noticed that Cheryl Lynn is who's on this, um, who's w watching the webinar, comes from a small parish in the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and they're talking to the YMCA about how they might partner. You know that parish, you know that site. Maybe you could say a few words about some of its assets that might serve, even for a smaller parish, might serve the community. Yeah, it's it, oh, great. And I, I'm going to be curious to find out a little bit more from Sherilyn, but this is a, a small parish um, in the Diocese of Easton. So it's the eastern shore of Maryland, which is pretty rural uh, for the most part, and lots of small towns. Uh, 
And one of the cool things about this place, this is an 18th century, so, this, so 1837, they were already uh, over 100 years old by, this, by that point. And um, uh, what, this is Shrewsbury Parish. I mean, it's so old, it, it really, it's just, it's just Shrewsbury Parish. Um, but they have an enormous amount of land around them. So they have, uh, I mean, it's really incredibly picturesque. Uh, an old graveyard, a separate building for their parish house, a small historic church with parts of it going back to the 18th century, and then a lot of property, and then some additional buildings. And so one of the things that we heard from Cheryl Lynn was that uh, the YMCA wants to do, um, wants to reopen and start doing activities outside and in fact, one of the key things that Shrewsbury Parish, who went through our New Dollars training, has been uh, working on is, what do we do with our outdoor space? How do we activate it more so that it's not so passive, so that we can really do some new ministry or work with some other people who might be able to use it, maybe even generate some income to support our other ministries. But, you know, what's the range of opportunities we have here for that land? And so they've got land. And uh, so they're going to be checking in with the YMCA to have a conversation about how they might be able to support that, which I think is so wonderful. And that's, that's that connecting the dots piece that's so key. And that's a small parish too. <laughs> yeah, so I again want to encourage people if you have questions for our panelists to put those into the chat box, um, to the Q&A box. Um, one of the things that we touched on a little bit in the webinar, and I know we got this question last time, um, is the, the importance of the mission and vision statements of the congregation as they are looking to respond to this crisis. And so I was wondering, uh, maybe starting with Bob, and then moving to Chris and Joshua, what place does the mission and vision statement have in these sorts of discussions, and how can that be a guide? Well, of course, every uh, congregation knows that they should have a sense of who they're called to serve and what, what they're all about and where are they going. And so a mission and vision statement is important because that's a, that's a kind of a guide, that's a framework for everything you do. But we also work with congregations to develop a third thing, which we call a case statement, which is also very helpful because it kind of says, you know, what, how do we see our assets? How do we see our strengths? Uh, what do we have? And who do we, who do we tend to serve? You know, why are we moved to serve certain populations? What can we say about the benefits we've given our community? Um, uh, you know, so it's like who we are, it's our building, what we have, and it's what we do with our building. And I think, so mission and vision supplemented by a sense of, you know, who we are and what's our history been and what do we have to offer can all be really helpful to a congregation, especially in all this change, you know. The change is scary, but it also opens up opportunities. And as I think Father Chris has said so well and Joshua has said so well, all, I think we're all saying that this is also an opportunity to be in conversation with our civic leaders, with our neighbors, um, just as Cheryl Lynn's parish was doing, working with the, the YMCA, saying, well, you know, you need grassy space for the kids you serve, and we have grassy space. Uh, that's a new way to look at that asset. So we, we think mission, vision, and a kind of sense of a case statement all can be kind of guiding documents when you are in conversation with your neighbors. Joshua, what would you add? Uh, well, unless uh, Chris wanted to jump in, I mean, I, I would just say, you know, we all realize, I think, that we're going to be different after this. And I, I think the key thing is understanding who we are as a, you know, as our congregations. What is, what is the core piece of our mission and who we serve? And, but also now, how are we going to be changed or evolve? Um, I think that's a key thing to think about. Um, change is a really frightening word, but evolution is maybe a better way to describe how a mission that a congregation feels called to, um, you know, does change over time. It, it doesn't mean that you're totally different, but it means that you've found a new way to articulate it, a new set of tools or a new way that it connects to that. So I think that's, you know, to be open to that because we, we're all trying, none of us can, none of us has a crystal ball. 
some of us might have maybe better data and we have a, uh, what we think is a clearer image of six or nine or 12 months from now, but truly none of us can see that far in the future and, and see an image clearly enough. And so the conversation is in part about how we're all going to do this together. And, you know, that's the key thing. The congregation is stronger the more it can embed itself and weave itself into the fabric of people's lives and institutions around it in the community. When it, you know, because it, when you get to that point, you, you can't, it's, it's, it's part of the, of, of the actual fabric of community, so to speak. And so that's, I think the key, those conversations help, help that develop. I think uh, that the, as you pointed out, Joshua, these statements have a necessity to be able to evolve because that's the world we live in. And, and I like the fact that what Bob's showing is a whole nother evolved sense of knowing who you are, uh, what you have and who you're there to serve is that case statement. What I'll say simply as a statement is that having that mission statement as a central piece of who All Saints is, why it's there, when it says worship, prayer, service, and stability and service, it made it so much more obvious and easy for me as the rector to come to my vestry and lean on our sense of stability and service to allow what we're doing to evolve immediately to adapt to a new uh, unfamiliar setting. And that statement gave me some flexibility, but I also would say that it helped me respond. And the key thing is make sure it stays pliable so that it too can respond to a new frontier. Great. Well, thank you all for answering the questions that were asked. Um, And thank you for the discussion. This was a great, great time we spent together. And this isn't the end of the conversation. We'll be sending out a follow-up message with more opportunities from partners, as well as the slide deck and the recording from this webinar. And so you can look forward and look in your inboxes for that. So if you still have questions about building stewardship during and after this crisis, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I will put the, the email addresses of our panelists here today into the chat box. Um, and I'll also put a link to our website in the chat box so you can get those before you, before you leave the meeting. So thank you all again for your time and attention uh, and stay healthy and safe.